Hey, good evening everybody and welcome to Love and Abundance Tarot. Welcome to tonight's sharing that I'm providing here on this channel. Uh, tonight, doing something a little bit different. I wanted to just, I, I'm reading this book called The Mastery of Love. And I'm reading it anyway, so I just thought, why don't I just do a recording, right? And that way, for those of you that are interested, you can listen in and you can enjoy part of this book experience that, that I'm participating in. Uh, it's a beautiful book with beautiful lessons in it. So for those of you that are tuned in, I'm happy to have you here and excited to be sharing this book with you. This is kind of a different turn for me to take. I'm not sure what to make of it. I'm not sure, uh, you know, whether or not there are others that'll be interested in, in hearing this, but I thought let's just give it a chance. Let's just give it a shot and see what happens. So, anyways, I'm excited to be here. Uh, today is November the 11th, so it's 11-11, 2019. The time is 6.48 p.m. Mountain Standard Time, uh, and today is Monday. So, beautiful day in the world. Um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and excited to be sitting with all of you and sharing sharing this uh, some of my own personal thoughts and experiences along with reading the book tonight. And tonight I thought, you know, what we would cover is I would go through the introduction of the book and then also read chapter one. Um, but before we start into that, I just want to talk a little bit about life, right? A little bit about life experience because we can all identify with that because we're all participating in this experience at the same time. Um, yeah, life, life experience. So, at the end of the day, and what I'm, what I'm sharing, right, my own personal thoughts and feelings, I don't claim them to be truth, right? They're my truth that I've arrived to, right? But my truth changes sometimes. But So this is the truth I'm sharing that I've arrived at today. Um, so life experience, right? At the end of the day, I like to believe that we're all spiritual beings participating in a human experience, right? And by spiritual beings, what I'm referring to is we are all infinite, eternal beings, right? Infinite, eternal energy participating in this human experience, right? This 3D experience, right? Where we slid into these bodies, right? We have these skins um, in order to create experience, right? To create the opportunity for individual growth, right? As well as collective growth. So, in order for this experience to take place, I've learned that it requires duality, right? Two opposing forces. Uh, at the end of the day, each and every one of us, what we truly are is we're all energy, right? Everything in life is all about energy. So, in order for life experience, we need duality, right? So. We have to have two opposing forces. And I feel like on one side, right, of our duality, we have our essence, which is our infinite, eternal being, right, that we came into this world with. It's always a part of us, right? But there has to be another side, right, to balance the scales, right? So I feel like that other side of the duality is, it's our ego, right? So we refer to it as Satan, Lucifer, the devil, right? The ego within all of us, uh, so we have these two opposing dichotomies, if you will, that we take on and we embrace as we step into this life experience. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because as children, right, especially young children, one, two, three years old, maybe four, right, so connected to our essence, to our infinite energy, because our egos haven't been affected yet, right? The egos really haven't come into play. Uh, many times the ego comes into play right around three or four years of age uh, when we're actually children. And many times, right, it comes to us by way of well-meaning and well-intentioned parents, right, or peers, teachers in our life, right, that, that, that mean well. But here we are as children, right, and all we're interested in doing is just exploring life, right? Life is so exciting. You're looking for the new adventure, the new sense of excitement. Um, you know, not, not really in that position to really have our egos come into effect. We're really taking on fear and anger and resentment, right? We're just not connected with those energies yet. It takes a few years for that to kick in. And it happens when we're, when we're children, right? And once, once that 
once that journey begins, it seems like then life just kind of kicks in uh, and it takes over, right? And it seems like our egos become more and more inflamed, if you will. Um, so we have this, these, these two dualities, right? So we're trying to maintain this balance. And if I just sit back and I look at the world today, I look at the world that we've created, right? If we're looking at these two opposing dichotomies, what is the world that we live in today, right? Is this an essence, an eternal, infinite kind of experience, right? Or is this more of an ego kind of experience, right? And so as I look at the world, the way I perceive the world today is I think right, the scales of balance are a little offset right now. If anything, you know, the world we live in today is more of an ego-driven world, right? And what do I use to back that up? Homelessness, starvation, wars, murders, killing. This, it's mine, not yours, you know? Which is kind of funny if we think about it, because at the end of the day, we're all just guests here. You know, there really is no ownership. So, anyways, I picked out this book. Uh, my son received this book for his birthday. He received a few books, and I was able to pull this one from him because he was going to read the other two first. And I'm, get, I'm really happy and excited that I have the chance to read this book. And I have, I'm excited that I have the chance to share it with all of you. So let's get into it real quickly here. <clears throat> so I'm going to have to throw on my spectacles, right, for the for the reading. And I and I've um, I've turned the lights down a little bit, right. This is an evening recording, so I'm trying to set a more comfortable mood and, and ambiance, if you will, right, so that uh, all of you have a chance to really listen, right, and to take in these wisdom that this wisdom that's coming and being shared with us, right, from this beautiful author in this book. So the book is called The Mastery of Love. The author is Don Miguel Ruiz. And I just want to read a little bit to you about this book so we can gain a better understanding of what it's about. In the Toltec tradition, three fundamental masteries guide us to our true nature, which is happiness, freedom, and love. The first is the mastery of awareness. This mastery teaches us to be aware of what we really are, it is the first step towards freedom because we cannot be free if we don't know what we are or what kind of freedom we are looking for. The Toltec said, let us see ourselves with truth and they created a mastery just for awareness. The second is the mastery of transformation which teaches us how to become spiritual warriors and stock our actions and reactions so we can break free of the knowledge that enslaves us. This mastery shows us how to change the dream of our life by changing our agreements and our beliefs. The mastery of love is the result of the first two masteries. From the Toltec perspective, everything is made of love. Love is life itself. When we master love, we align with the spirit of life passing through us. We are no longer the body or the mind or the soul. We are love. Then every action we take is an expression of love and love and action can produce happiness. When we master awareness, transformation, and love, we reclaim our divinity and become one with God. This is the goal of the Toltec. Right? So it's these three steps or processes that the book is going to take us through in order for us to become masters right, of our own domain, masters of mastery of love. Okay, so I just want to begin by reading the introduction with all of you. We're going to learn a bit, little bit about the Toltec now, right? The civilization. The Toltec. Thousands of years ago, the Toltec were known throughout modern Mexico or southern Mexico as women and men of knowledge. Anthropologists have spoken of the Toltec as a nation or a race, but in fact the Toltec were scientists and artists who formed a society to explore and conserve the spiritual knowledge and practices of the ancient ones. They came together as masters, Naguals, N-A-G-U-A-L-S, and students at the Teotihuacan, the ancient city of pyramids outside Mexico City, known as the place where man becomes God. Interesting. Over the millennia, the Naguals were forced to conceal the ancestral wisdom and maintain its existence in obscurity. European con conquest, coupled with rampant misuse of personal power by a few of the apprentices, 
made it necessary to shield the knowledge from those who were not prepared to use it wisely or who might intentionally misuse it for personal gain. Fortunately, the esoteric Toltec knowledge was embodied and passed on through generations by different lineages of Noggles. Though it remained veiled in secrecy for hundreds of years, ancient prophecies foretold the coming of an age when it would be necessary to return to the wisdom to the people. Now Don Miguel Ruiz, a Nago from Eagle Knight lineage, has been guided to share with us the powerful teachings of the Toltec. Toltec knowledge arises from the same essential unity of truth as all the sacred esoteric traditions found around the world. Though it is not a religion, it honors all the spiritual masters who have taught on earth. While it does embrace spirit, it is most accurately described as a way of life distinguished by the ready accessibility of happiness and love. A Toltec is an artist of love, an artist of the spirit, someone who is creating every moment, every second, the most beautiful art, the art of dreaming. Life is nothing but a dream, and if we are artists, then we can create our life with love, and our dream becomes a masterpiece of art. Right? And I truly believe that within me. Right? I really do believe that, you know, at the end of the day, I wouldn't be at all surprised if, you know, when we experience death, that really what that experience is like is like waking up from a dream, right? And what dream are we waking up from? This dream, right? Your dream. Um, yeah, that just that just feels like truth to me, right? And we, if, we, if we think about it, right, if we all had the power, right, if we had the ability to control our dreams, We'd probably set up some dreams, right, where we could just experience bliss, right? Everything that we've ever dreamed or imagined of being able to experience and to participate in, right, that we would get that experience, right? But I can't help but think that after a few days of that, we might step back and say, you know, that was fun and everything. However, what if we change things up, right? What if we threw in some unpredictability, right? Give me something that I can't see coming, right? And that's truly what it is we've created here in this experience, right? We've, we've created that kind of experience for ourselves, where we're stepping into a world of unpredictability, where we've stepped into this, this physical human experience, right, with these two opposing dichotomies. And if we look at we look at life, right? We look at the the, the, the you know the, the history of life. Um, you know, several years ago, we stepped into what the Mayans call the era of in the era of enlightenment, right? Of of truthfulness and understanding, and I see that as being a raise of the vibration collectively throughout the world. Um, and the reason that this era of enlightenment, I believe, is there, right? I mean, light workers around the world are busy, busy at work right now, right? Trying to put their message out, right? Trying to share truth with others. So anyways, it's a, it's a beautiful life experience. Um, two opposing dichotomies. So I feel, I feel like the, you know, the better we can understand the meaning and the purpose of our life, the better prepared we are to be able to step into this dream and be able to manifest with love, right? Manifest the kind of experience that we're all capable of manifesting. You know, that in some way, shape or form, with the individual effort from each and every one of us, right? We can shift. We can change things. We can shift the world. We can shift the energy of the world and raise the vibration, so that moving forward, painful issues like home homelessness, right, starvation, wars, murders, killing, those are limiting energies that can go away. Why? Because we're raising our vibration collectively as a civilization. And I feel like we are in the era of enlightenment right now. So this is a beautiful time to be alive for each and every one of us. Okay. All right, let's continue. So I'm going to begin with the introduction now. It's called The Master. Once upon a time, a master was talking to a crowd of people, and his message was so wonderful that everyone felt touched by his words of love. In the crowd, there was a man who had listened to every word the master said. This man was very humble, and he had a great heart. He was so touched by the master's words that he felt the need to invite the master to his home. 
When the master finished speaking, the man walked through the crowd, looked into the eyes of the master and told him, I know you are busy and everyone wants your attention. I know you hardly have time to even listen to my words, but my heart is so open and I feel so much love for you that I have the, the need to invite you to my home. I want to prepare the best meal for you. I don't expect you will accept, but I just had to let you know. The master looked into the man's eyes and with the most beautiful smile, he said, prepare everything. I will be there. Then the master walked away. At these words, the joy in the man's heart was strong. He could hardly wait to serve the master and to express his love for him. This would be the most important day of his life. The master was going to be with him. He bought the best food and wine and found the most beautiful clothes to offer as a gift to the master. Then he ran home to prepare everything to receive the master. He cleaned his entire house, prepared the most wonderful meal, and made the table look beautiful. His heart was full of joy because the master would soon be there. The man was waiting anxiously when someone knocked at the door. Eagerly, he opened the door, but instead of the master, he found the old woman. She looked into his eyes and said, I'm star I am starving. Can you give me a piece of bread? The man was a little disappointed because it was not the master. He looked at the woman and said, Please, come into my house. He sat her at the place he had prepared for the master and gave her the food he had made for the master. But he was anxious and could hardly wait for her to finish eating. The old woman was touched by the generosity of this man. She thanked him and left. The man had barely finished preparing the table for the master again when someone knocked at the door. This time it was another stranger who had traveled across the desert. The stranger looked into the man's face and said, I am thirsty. Can you give me something to drink? The man was a little disappointed again because it was not the master. He invited the stranger into his home and sat him in the place he had prepared for the master. He served the wine he intended to give the master. When the stranger left, the man again prepared everything for the master. Someone knocked at the door again. When the man opened the door, there stood a child. The child looked up at the man and said, I am freezing. Can you give me a blanket to cover my body? The man was a little disappointed because it was not the master, but he looked into the eyes of the child and felt love in his heart. Quickly, he gathered the clothes he had intended to give the master and he covered the child with the clothes. The child thanked him and left. The man prepared everything again for the master, and then he waited until it was very late. When, when he realized the master was not coming, he was disappointed. But right away he forgave the master. He said to himself, I knew I could not expect the master to come to this humble home. Although he said he would come, something more important must have taken him elsewhere. The master did not come, but at least he told me he would, and that is enough for my heart to be happy. Slowly he put the food away, he put the wine away, and he went to bed. That night he dreamed the master came to his home. The man was happy to see him, but he didn't know that he was dreaming. Master, you came. You kept your word. The master replied, Yes, I am here, but I was here before. I was hungry, and you fulfilled my need for food. I was thirsty, and you gave me the wine. I was cold, and you covered me with clothes. Whatever you do for others, you do for me. The man woke up and his heart was filled with happiness because he understood what the master had taught him. The master loved him so much that he had sent three people to give him the greatest lesson. The master lives within everyone. When you give food to the one who is starving, when you give water to the one who is thirsty, when you cover the one who is cold, you give your love to the master. Okay. I love that. I love this introduction. Right? I love the experience that, that it goes through and it depicts and that it shares. You know, reminding each and every one of us, right, that at the end of the day, we're all connected. We're all brothers and sisters, right? There's no difference between myself and any of you. We're all equal, completely equal, right? Participating in this experience, being brought up in different circumstances, uh, but still all of us being challenged with understanding life, right? Being able to manage these two opposing dualities. Okay, let's start chapter one now. 
Chapter one is called The Wounded Mind. I relate, so many of you may relate too. Perhaps you have never thought about it, but on one level or another, all of us are masters. We are masters because we have the power to create and to rule our own lives. Just as societies and religions around the world create incredible mythologies, we create our own. Our personal mythology is populated by heroes and villains. Angels and demons, kings and commoners, we create an entire population in our mind, including multiple personalities for ourselves. Then we master the image we are going to use in certain circumstances. We become artists of pretending and projecting our images, and we master whatever we believe we are. When we meet other people, we classify them right away and assign them to a role in our lives. We create an image for others according to what we believe they are, and we do the same thing with everyone and everything around us. You have the power to create. Your power is so strong that whatever you believe comes true. You create yourself, whatever you believe you are. You are the way you are because that is what you believe about yourself. Your whole reality, everything you believe, is your creation. You have the same power as any other human in the world. The main difference between you and someone else is how you apply your power what you create with your power. You may be similar to others in many ways, but no one in the whole world lives his or her life just the way you do. You have practiced all your life to be what you are, and you do it so well that you master what you believe you are. You master your own personality, your own beliefs. You master every action, every reaction. You practice for years and years, and you achieve the level of mastery to be what you believe you are. Once we can see that all of us are masters, we can see what kind of mastery we have. When we are children and we have a problem with someone, we get angry. For whatever reason, that anger pushes the problem away. We get the result we want. It happens a second time. We react with anger. And now we know if we get angry, we push the problem away. Then we practice and practice until we become masters of anger. In the same way we become masters of jealousy, masters of sadness, masters of self-rejection. All of our trauma, all of our drama and suffering is by practice. We make an agreement with ourselves and we practice that agreement until it becomes a whole mastery. The way we think, the way we feel, the way we act becomes so routine that we no longer need to put our attention on what we are doing. It is just by action-reaction that we behave a certain way. To become masters of love, we have to practice love. The art of relationship is also a whole mastery. And the only way to reach mastery is with practice. To master a relationship is therefore about action. It is not about concepts or attaining knowledge. It is about action. Of course, to have action, we need to have some knowledge, or at least a little more awareness, of the way humans operate. I want you to imagine that you live on a planet where everyone has a skin disease. For two or three thousand years, the people on your planet have suffered the same disease. Their entire bodies are covered by wounds that are infected, and those wounds really hurt when you touch them. Of course, they believe this is a normal physiology of the skin. Even the medical books described in this disease as a normal condition. When the people are born, their skin is healthy, but around three or four years of age, excuse me just a sec, re-upping the music here. Uh, by the time they're teenagers, excuse me, but by around three or four years of age, the first wounds start to appear. By the time they are teenagers, there are wounds all over their bodies. Can you imagine how these people are going to treat each other? In order to relate with one another, they have to protect their wounds. They hardly ever touch each other's skin because it is too painful. If by accident you touch someone's skin, it is so painful that right away she gets angry and touches your skin, just to get even. Still, the instinct to love is so strong that you pay a high price to have relationships with others. Well, imagine that a miracle occurs one day. You awake and your skin is completely healed. There are no wounds anymore and it doesn't hurt to be touched. Healthy skin you can touch feels wonderful because the skin is made for perception. 
Can you imagine yourself with a healthy skin in a world where everyone has a skin disease? You cannot touch others because it hurts them and no one touches you because they make the assumption that it will hurt you. If you can imagine this, perhaps you can understand that someone from another planet who came to visit us would have a similar experience with humans. But it isn't our skin that is full of wounds. What the visitor would discover is that the human mind is sick with a disease called fear. Just like the description of the infected skin, the emotional body is full of wounds. And these wounds are infected with emotional poison. The manifestation of the disease of fear is anger, hate, sadness, envy, and hypocrisy. The result of the disease is all the emotions that make humans suffer. All humans are mentally sick with the same disease. We can even say that this world is a mental hospital. But this mental disease has been in this world for thousands of years. And the medical books, the psychiatric books, and the psychology books describe the disease as normal. They consider it normal, but I can tell you it is not normal. When the fear becomes too great, the reasoning mind starts to fail and can no longer take all those wounds with all the poison. In the psychology books, we call this a mental illness. We call it schizophrenia, paranoia, psychosis, but these diseases are created when the reasoning mind is so frightened and the wounds so painful that it becomes better to break contact with the outside world. Humans live in continuous fear of being hurt and this creates a big drama wherever we go. The way humans relate to each other is so emotionally painful that for no apparent reason we get angry, jealous, envious, sad. To even say I love you can be frightening. But even if it's painful and fearful to have an emotional interaction, still we keep going. We enter into a relationship, we get married, and we have children. In order to protect our emotional wounds and because of our fear of being hurt, humans create something very sophisticated in the mind. A big denial system. In that denial system, we become the perfect liars. We lie so perfectly that we lie to ourselves and we even believe our own lies. We don't notice we are lying and sometimes even when we know we are lying, we justify the lie and excuse the lie to protect ourselves from the pain of our wounds. The, the denial system is like a wall of fog in front of our eyes that blinds us from seeing the truth. We wear a social mask because it's too painful to see ourselves or to let others see us as we really are. And the denial system lets us pretend that everyone believes what we want them to believe about us. We put up these barriers for protection, to keep other people away. But those barriers also keep us inside, restricting our freedom. Humans cover themselves and protect themselves. And when someone says, you are pushing my buttons, it is not exactly true. What is true is that you are touching a wound in the mind and he or she reacts because it hurts. When you are aware that everyone around you has emotional wounds with emotional poison, you can easily understand the relationship of humans in what the Toltecs call the dream of hell. From the Toltec perspective, everything we believe about ourselves and everything we know about the world is a dream. If you look at any religious description of hell, it is the same as human society, the way we dream. Hell is a place of suffering, a place of fear, a place of war and violence, a place of judgment and no justice, a place of punishment that never ends. There are humans versus humans in a jungle of predators, humans full of judgment, full of blame, full of guilt, full of emotional poison, envy, anger, hate, sadness, suffering. We create all these little demons in our mind because we have learned to dream hell in our own life. Each of us creates a personal dream for our own self. But the humans before us created a big outside dream, the dream of the human society. The outside dream or the dream of the planet is the collective dream of billions of dreamers. The big dream includes all the rules of society, its laws, its religions, its different cultures and ways to be. All of this information stored inside our mind is like a thousand voices talking to us at once. The Toltecs call this the matote. The real us is pure love. We are life. The real us has nothing to do with the dream. But the matote keeps us from seeing what we really are. 
when you see the dream from this perspective, and if you have the awareness of what you are, you see the nonsense behavior of humans, and it becomes amusing. What for everyone else is a big drama for you becomes a comedy. You can see human suffering over something that is not important, that is not even real. But we have no choice. We are born in this society, we grow up in this society, and we learn to be like everyone else, playing nonsense all the time, competing with mere nonsense. All this sounds so familiar to me. Imagine you could visit a planet where everyone has a different kind of emotional mind. The way they relate to each other is always in happiness, always in love, always in peace. Now imagine that one day you awake on this planet and you no longer have wounds in your emotional body. You are no longer afraid to be who you are. Whatever someone says about you or whatever they do, you don't take it personally and it doesn't hurt anymore. You no longer need to protect yourself. You are not afraid to love, to share, to open your heart. But no one else is like you. How can you relate with people who are emotionally wounded and sick with fear? When a human is born, the emotional mind, the emotional body is completely healthy. Maybe around three or four years of age, the first wounds in the emotional body start to appear and get infected with emotional poison. But if you observe children who are two or three years old, if you see how they behave, they are playing all the time. You see them laughing all the time. Their imagination is so powerful. And the way they dream is an adventure of exploration. When something is wrong, they react and defend themselves. But when they just let go and turn their attention to the moment again, to play again, to explore and have fun again, they are living in the moment. They are not ashamed of the past. They are not worried about the future. Little children express what they feel, and they are not afraid to love. The happiest moments in our lives are when we are playing just like children, when we are singing and dancing, when we are exploring and creating just for fun. It is wonderful when we behave like a child because this is the normal human mind, the normal human tendency. As children, we are innocent, and it is natural for us to express love. But what has happened to us? What has happened to the whole world? What has happened is that when we are children, the adults already have that mental disease, and they are highly contagious. How did they pass this disease to us? They hook our attention, and they teach us to be like them. That is how we pass our disease to our children. And that is how parents, our teachers, our older siblings, the whole society of sick, sick people infected us with that disease. They hooked our attention and put information into our mind through repetition. This is the way we learned. This is the way we program a human mind. The problem is the program, the information we have stored in our mind. By hooking the attention, we teach our children a language, how to read, how to behave, how to dream. We domesticate humans the same way we domesticate a dog or any other animal, with punishment and reward. This is perfectly normal. What we call education is nothing but domestication of the human being. When we are afraid to be punished, but later we are also afraid of not letting, of not getting the reward, of not being good enough for mom and dad, sibling or teacher, the need to be accepted is born. Before that, we don't care whether we are accepted or not. People's opinions are not important. They are, they are not important because we just want to play and live in the present. The fear of not getting the reward becomes the fear of rejection. The fear of not being good enough for someone else is what makes us try to change, what makes us create an image. Then we try to project that image according to whatever they want us to be, just to be accepted, just to have the reward. We learn to pretend to be what we are not and we practice trying to be someone else, just to be good enough for mom, for dad, for the teacher, for our religion, for whatever. We practice and practice, and we master how to be what we are not. Soon we forget who we really are, and we start to live our images. We create not just one image, but many different images according to the different groups of people we associate with. We create an image at home, an image at school, and when we grow up, we create even more images. This is also true for a simple relationship between a man and a woman. The woman has an outer image that she tries to project to others, but when she is alone, she has another image of herself. 
the man also has an outer image and an inner image. By the time they are adults, the inner image and the outer image are so different that they hardly match anymore. In the relationship between a man and woman, there are four images at least. How can they really know each other? They don't. They can only try to understand the image, but there are more images to consider. When a man meets a woman, he makes an image of her from his point of view, and the woman makes an image of the man from her point of view. Then he or she tries to make he or she fit the image he makes for her, and she tries to make him fit the image she makes for him. Now there are six images between them. Of course, they are lying to each other, even if they don't know they are lying. The relationship is based on fear. It is based on lies. It is not based on truth because they cannot see through all of the fog. In the period when we are little children, there is no conflict with the images we pretend to be. Our images are not really challenged until we begin to interact with the outside world and no longer have our parents' protection. This is why being a teenager is particularly difficult. Even if we are prepared to support and defend our images, as soon as we try to project our images to the outside world, the world fights back. The outside world starts proving to us, not just privately but publicly, that we are not what we pretend to be. Let's take the example of a teenage boy who pretends to be very intelligent. He goes to a debate at school, and in that debate, someone who is more intelligent and more prepared wins the debate and makes him look ridiculous in front of everyone. He will try to explain and excuse and justify his image in front of his peers. He will be so kind to everyone and will try to save his image in front of them, but he knows he is lying. Of course he tries his best not to break in front of his peers, but as soon as he's alone and sees himself in the mirror, he goes and breaks the mirror. He hates himself. He feels that he is so stupid, that he is the worst. There is a big discrepancy between the inner image and the image he tries to project to the outside world. The bigger the discrepancy, the more difficult the adaptation to the society dream, and the less love he will have for himself. Between the image he pretends to be and the inner image when he is alone are lies and more lies. Both images are completely out of touch with reality. They are false, but he doesn't see that. Maybe someone else can see that, but he's completely blind. His denial system tries to protect the wounds, but the wounds are real, and he is hurting because he is trying so hard to defend an image. When we are children, we learn that everyone's opinions are important, and we rule our lives according to those opinions. A simple opinion from someone can put us deeper into hell. An opinion that is not even true. You look ugly. You are wrong. You are stupid. Opinions have a lot of power over the nonsense behavior of people who live in hell. That is why we need to hear that we are good, that we are doing well, that we are beautiful. How do I look? How was what I said? How am I doing? We need to hear the opinions of others because we are domesticated and we can be manipulated by these opinions. That is why we seek recognition from other people. We need emotional support from other people. We need to be accepted by the outside dream via other people. That is why teenagers drink alcohol, take drugs, or start smoking. It is just to be accepted by other people who have all those opinions. It is just to be considered cool. So many humans are suffering because of all the false images we try to project. Humans pretend to be something very important, but at the same time, we believe we are nothing. We work so hard to become someone in that society dream, to be recognized and approved by others. We try so hard to be important, to be a winner, to be powerful, to be rich, to be famous, to express our personal dream, and to impose our dream onto other people around us. Why? Because humans, we believe the dream is real, and we take it very seriously. Okay. All right, so there's the introduction and chapter one of The Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. I'm really glad that I had the chance to read this out loud, right, and to do this recording for you guys, right? For those of you that are interested in watching it, um, beautiful book, right? I, I relate to it in so many ways, right? Guilty as charged with everything that it's going through and talking about, right, through our life experience, 
with these false beliefs, right? That's been my experience in life, right? And now I'm looking for, I'm seeking for truth. I'm looking to manage, create better energy for myself. I'm looking to try to gain a better understanding of the real meaning and purpose of life so that I can embrace life and live life more fully, right? I hope all of you are on the same spiritual journey. Okay, all right guys, have a beautiful night tonight. Thank you so much for letting me share. Sleep well.